Good morning, church. How are we doing? I'm glad you guys came back. I didn't know if we were going to have people today because, you know, it's a very uncomfortable topic to talk about, right? The cost of not knowing. And last week we had a very amazing word by Nicole who brought, uh, it was called cash or calling, right? And uh, it was about whether you're chasing your calling or you're just chasing cash, right? Are we looking for purpose or are we just chasing paper, right? And so uh, today I get to talk about week two of our uh, series, The Cost of Not Knowing. And my, me- my message is titled, Money Matters, okay? Money matters, okay? Now, I'm not just saying that money matters in the sense where you have to care about it. But what about the things about money? And how should we be towards money? How should we matter towards money, okay? And uh, before I do that, I want to get into, I want to pray a little, real quick. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity. Lord, may, I'm just a vessel. Lord, may it be your word and not mine, your will and not mine. Lord, may you open the hearts of everybody that is here. Lord, that you bless everybody that gave, Lord, and that this isn't just information but transformation in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So as we discovered last week, the cost of not knowing can be very expensive. Am I right? Like you could have all the money in the world but have no happiness. Right? You could have everything you've ever prayed for, everything you've ever wanted, but still feel so empty inside. Right? Have you ever achieved something that you wanted and then you get it and you're just like, this isn't what I thought. I thought this was going to make me feel better. I thought I would be better if I had this. I thought if this was added to me, then, then my life became more full. Have you ever felt like that? You ever worked so hard for something just for it to be like, well, I still feel the same, right? You ever been so full that you're just like, man, I don't even know what to do anymore, right? And so we want to we wanted discover today that money does matter, but so do you. Yes. It's not just about chasing money, but you also matter to God, yes. right? And how does money affect that? I'm going to give you some facts today. Did you know that you are two times more likely to attempt suicide or have suicidal thoughts compared to someone who doesn't have money problems? Do you know that 44% of Americans state that financial issues is the number one stressor and reason they are depressed? And you may ask, what does this have to do with the church? Why do we need to speak about money in the church? See, tithing and giving offering, offering isn't a bright idea that we came up with. It isn't some, oh, it's just we need money, so we're going to tell you guys that the Bible says this, but it's not really true. See, no, it is actually biblical as to why we actually say give your tithes and offerings. It's not a bright, bright idea to pay the bills. No, that's not why we tell you. We tell you because God wants to bless you through it. Because you're giving back from what he already gave you. It's not because we need it. I don't receive anything from what you give. And I do this because God has loved me so much. See, that's why I give. That's why tithes and offerings are so important. Did you know that Jesus spoke the double amount of times about money in comparison to heaven and hell? 16 of 38 parables that Jesus spoke were about money and possessions. 16 of 38. Okay, I'm not going to give you the percentages, it's a little bit under 50, right, yeah, okay. And there are about 500 verses on prayer and faith and over 2,000 verses about money and possessions. So if you think money does not matter, you are very mistaken. Just because you overlook it doesn't mean that God does. Just because you don't want to have your relationship with God be in your finances doesn't mean that God doesn't care about it. See, just because you don't think it's important doesn't mean it's not important to God. See, it's not about you measuring God to how you want him to be. It's about you measuring up to who God wants you to be. And that includes your finances. That includes your money. See, God gave us a powerful truth. Jesus gave us a powerful truth in scripture. And it's in Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We love to talk about our heart, right? God, heal my heart, right? I'm just going to follow the desires of my heart. But your heart is following the desires of your treasure. See, you want to follow your heart, and your heart's following treasure. See, if you really want to know where your heart's at with God, check where your treasure is going. If you really want to know how much you actually truly have God in your life and in your heart, check your balances. Check what you spend on. Check Because if you can't even give to God 10%, how could he bless you with the rest of the 90 I mean, it's just basic math. The thing is about God, it's not so basic because God is going to bless you tenfold, a hundredfold, thirtyfold, however much he wants to. The problem is we like to see it at such a small level that it's hard for us to even believe it. Right? God isn't concerned about your treasure. He's concerned about your heart. See, God's not trying to fix your treasure. God's not trying to fix your bank account. He's trying to fix your heart. 
And when he does that, you will then want to fix your bank account. Because it's not because of God, it is from God. It is not because you're trying to prove yourself to God. It's because, God, you are so good that I want to obey every single thing you say. See, we talk about tithes and offerings a lot. And it's true, 10%. That's all that God asked for. Don't, don't stress. I'm not going to tell you 11%. I'm not going to tell you any of that. 12 It's not going up. There's no interest. Although the, don't, don't stress out right now, right? It's not like our, our country right now. It's, it's not, there's no inflation, okay? Gas prices are still 250 in heaven, okay? Here it's not, right? I, I, oh my gosh, I dreaded the day. You know, I used to love being in Vegas. I'd say, yeah, when we talked about Cali, you're like, yeah, we'll look at our gas prices, right? That'd be something you could tell a Cali person, be like, and I'm from Cali, but Vegas is my home, I'm sorry. I was born in California, but this is my place, this is my church, I love it here, everything I've had is here. So I love Vegas, so I'm a Vegas person, even though I was born in Cali, who cares, whatever. So I used to say, oh, well, look at our prices, and Cali was like always $4. And now I'm sitting here, I'm like, what's going on? What are we doing? Like, what's going on right here? It's for something. Like, now I want a Tesla so bad, right? And they're trying to force us to get a Tesla. That's why they're up. Anyways. Um, but he knows the best way to test your heart is to see where your treasure goes. It's almost like there's a direct artery from our wallet to our heart. It's almost there's like a direct vein that's pumping blood from our heart to our money, right? Because you ever been, like, be honest, okay? Payday is the best day. Don't even act right now. You are much nicer when it's payday than when it's not, right? You, you hate the following Monday because you paid all your bills and you're like back to being miserable, right? But when it's payday, you treat everybody nice. Oh, you want lunch? Lunch is on me, right? You, you, you happy, you, you're so happy on payday, right? Don't act. Don't even sit there and try to be like, that's just you. No, we are all, I'm happy on payday too. I'm not stressing. I'm like, God, you have been good, right? But then Monday, I'm like, God, where are you at, right? Like, it's just like, what's going on right now? So it's, it's true. It happens. It's normal. You are human. The problem is not that we are human. The problem is that we keep disconnected from God in our finances. We keep telling God, okay, God, bless me in every single other way. Bless my kids. Bless everything. But don't touch my money. Right? It's my money, and I need it now. Right? That's what we tell God. God, where's my money at? Right? See, I love these quotes by Billy Graham. It says, if a person gets his attitude towards money straight... It will help straighten out almost every other area of his life, okay? There is nothing wrong with men possessing riches. The wrong comes when riches possesses men. See, there is nothing wrong with how much you have in your bank account. It's when, what's wrong is when your bank account has you. There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having little or having a lot. It's when whatever you do have controls you. It's, when, it's not even just about money. It could be everything, that your car. Maybe you're so obsessed with your car that you only worry about your car and not your kids, wow. right? Or maybe you're only worried about work and you don't even care how much you get paid. You're just trying to get promoted. You don't care about anybody else. You don't care to make friends. You don't care to be good. You're just like, you're so obsessed with whatever it is. It's not just about money. It's whatever possesses you. Maybe it's a sport. Maybe it's, I don't know, what else, what else could you be addicted to? I don't know. It's whatever. A whole bunch of alcohol. Maybe you buy a six-pack every day. Right? And then your kids are just hungry. And you're like, Ugh, why are you hungry? <clears throat> this isn't just a money problem. This is a spiritual problem. Yes. You guys need to understand that. We're not trying to fix your finances, although, yes, that is a part of it. We want you to understand that this is so much more than what you can see on the outside. This is affecting you in every single area of your life. And you've ignored this part of your life for so long because you think it just doesn't matter. God doesn't care about it. And you're right, he doesn't care about your money. He cares about you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. Not your money, about you. The problem is that money is included in that. So God cares about it too because it, it, it affects you. Does it not? Right? You treat your kids differently when you're paid and when you don't. Right? Don't turn on the AC while I'm driving. I can't afford the gas to go out, right? You tell people, <laughs> turn off the radio. We're not listening to nothing but air, right? You're just like, you're going to hear me breathe. Okay, you got to save gas, right? You treat, so, you treat people so differently from when you do, you do not have money. Right? Don't, don't even try to lie to me. It is true. And the thing is, we need to get over that. See, because God is with us whether we have money or we don't. So the problem isn't we shouldn't be showing people whether we're broke or rich. We should be showing people whether God is in us or he's not. See, we need to be Christ-like. I want to jump to a verse. It's in Luke 16, 13. It says, no one can serve two masters. 
Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, the New King James Version says it differently. It says instead of serving God and money, it says you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is an evil spirit of money. Okay? It's not just money itself because Christians love to say this and it's such a lie. Because first of all, you're saying it completely wrong. Money is not the root of all evil. That is not the verse. Have you even read it? It says the love for money. It doesn't say money itself. Money is just a resource. If you look at money, money doesn't have its own feet. Money doesn't move. It's in your wallet. It's not going anywhere unless someone else takes it, right? Money is not going to do its own thing and be like, all right, you know what, I'm out. I'm going to go somewhere real quick. No, money is not just going to leave just because. See, money is just a resource. How you spend it will determine a lot whether you're using it correctly or not. But money itself isn't going to use itself and be like, all right, I'm out. Peace out. You don't need me anymore. So we think it's money is the root of all evil. No, you can have money and still be a good person. We love to talk about all the rich people. They're so greedy. Look at all the money. Give it to everybody. We're all in the same boat. The problem is some have money, some have don't, but we're both in love with it because either you need it or one has too many. And you love to talk about the ones that have too many and how they should give to me because I don't want to work. I just want to be lazy. I don't want to go get a job. I kind of just want to live off the government and I don't want to do anything with my life. We love to do that, but we don't want to say, God, bless those people because they also need Jesus. Even the top 1% that they love to say, right? The top 1%, right? They pay way more in taxes than you anyway, so why are you complaining? You get a tax return. Hello? <laughs> See, mammon is an evil god of money. Mammon was created in Babylon, and Babylon means the planted in confusion. Let's not be confused today about money. Stop being confused, thinking it doesn't matter, thinking you don't need it because you do need it, all right? Thinking that God doesn't care about it. It's not just about stop being confused. You are not in that place. God wants to bless you. He wants to use you. And God has placed you in a place. And when he places you there, he wants to provide. And that includes money. God will give you the resources for your purpose. That includes money. The problem is when you've become so in love with the resource and not the source. We've replaced the source for the resource. We've replaced God for his blessings. We think that what God has given us is now our God. That's not how that works. Because what happens when God gives you something different that you don't like? Can you still worship God even though you don't like what's going on? Can you still praise God even though you got zero in your bank account? Can you still praise God even though you got a million in your bank account? See, how, is your, how you worship God when you got nothing, when you have it all, will say a lot about you. It's easy to worship when you're in need, but, it's, but we don't worship when we have it all. See, because you've fallen in love with the resource and you've replaced the source. God is the source of all your resources. You cannot replace him because if you do, he'll take it away. Trust me, I'm telling you right now, the minute you replace God with whatever, he's going to move it out of the way. And you're not going to like it. Okay? I'm telling you right now. We believe that if you work 60 hours a week, that's a blessing. See, we're confused. That's not. I've done it. I worked two jobs. It was for a season. It wasn't for my life. It's for a season. Trust me, your kids do need, do need to be fed. Don't get me wrong, but they also need their dad at home. And you're trying to show them how to be a man. You can't because you're never there. You think that if you're just working, you're more manly, that has nothing to do with it. They don't know how to treat anybody or treat a woman because they're too busy not knowing what it's like. You have to be home. You got, God, God is going to take care of you. You have to take care of what he's given you. Before I do that, I want to jump to Luke 12, 15. It says, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Life does not consist. Life is not about how much you own. See, it's so crazy. You're, you know celebrities, right? What is something you search up sometimes about a celebrity when you not, want to know how much they have? Their net worth, right? And based upon how much they own, based upon their assets, it'll tell you their net worth is so-and-so, right? And the thing is, just because we, we're not on there, we're not on Google, and no one's searching up our net worth, we think we have no worth. Wow. See, but you have your own net worth, 
And it's not about the money you own. It's called Jesus because he paid it all. See, your net worth isn't based upon what you own. It's based upon who he is. If you feel less valuable because you have no money, trust me, you are not putting God in the right place. And if you feel too valuable because you have it all and you don't even worry about God, then you also have taken God out of his place. See, life isn't about the abundance of possessions. It's about his purpose in your life. As we learned last week, it's about the calling. It's about the calling, okay? There are three points I want to give you that sometimes we can tell that we are being possessed by our, it's not possessed, we are being overtaken by our possessions, okay? Number one, I put it, secured the bag, okay? Secured the bag, right? We believe that once we have secured the bag, we have secured ourselves, We believe that our security lies solely in what we have, that if you don't have it, you don't feel safe, right? You've secured the bag. You're like, I got it. Secured the bag means like it's mine. Like no one's touching it. You can't mess with it. It's mine. I did the work. Now it's mine, right? You've secured the bag. The problem is what if God takes it away? Can you still feel secure? See, what you don't realize is insecurity is just where you place your security. If you are insecure, it's because you've placed your security in something that isn't stable. If you are insecure, it's because you've placed your security on something that is not God. If you are insecure about how you look, it's because you've placed your security in what you don't like about yourself. But when you have God in your life and you've placed your security in God, you don't need to feel insecure because no matter how you look, no matter where you're at, no matter what you've been through, God is going to use you. No matter how much you own or how much you do not have, when your security is in God, it doesn't matter the bag, the size of it. What matters is the size of God in your life. Come on, somebody. Proverbs 18.11. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it, it is a wall too high to scale. See, that's exactly how we feel sometimes. We create these huge walls whether we do or do not have money. Trust me, you need to leave an open door for God. Stop pushing them out of the way in your finances. Stop being like, God, get out of here. I don't want to give you anything. You have it all, right? Number two, iced out, right? You guys know what that means when you're iced out? Anybody know, huh? Yeah, I see basketball players all the time, football players with their chain, right? Right? Some of them go like this, like ice in my veins, right? They're iced out, right? They got that chain, that diamonds all over their neck. They got diamonds all over their wrists. And though they might have all of that, they've placed their value in that. See, because they've become so obsessed with how they present themselves and less about their purpose. They become more obsessed with what they possess than the God that has given them a purpose. That's why they have to flex it, because that's all they got. And I'm, just talking, I'm not just talking about them. Don't get me wrong. You do the same thing. You may not have a diamond necklace, but whatever you do have, you got to flex it. It may be small, maybe something, but you got to flex something. Why? Because you've placed your value in that. See, don't let this confuse you. There's nothing wrong with owning any of that. There's nothing wrong with owning diamond rings, having a diamond necklace. It has nothing to do with that. The issue is when it owns you. The issue is when it owns you. You can have all of that and still be an amazing person. None of that matters, right? We love to create. See, the Bible says it. God does not judge the way we judge. God looks at the inside while we judge on the outside. So you could have a diamond ring, or if you don't, God's still going to know how you are on the inside, and that's all he's worried about. We like to say, oh, look at them. They must be greedy because they have that. Yeah, but what if that's something they enjoy? Just like you have something you enjoy. You don't want nobody to take that away from you, right? The problem is not that they have that. It's that it has them, okay? Number three, bread maker, all right? Or you could say bread winner. I don't know how you want to sell it. You know what bread is. It's money, right? Got to go get that bread. Right? We say that. Have you any of you never said that? No one's ever said that? I've never said it. Only bread I'm talking about is sandwiches. But anyways, um, bread maker. All right? Bread maker. We believe since we are bread makers or the bread winners, the money makers, that it all belongs to us. Since we made it, it's mine. Right? It's the same thing with your kids. You made the kid, it's your kid. Right? Since I made it, it's mine. It's my bread. You didn't work 40 hours for this, it's mine. You didn't work 60 hours. You didn't work overtime. You didn't do this. You didn't, it's my money, and I need it now, right? So we think we're the bread makers, and since we're the bread makers, it all belongs to us. 
that's an issue. Because in Matthew 14, 17 to 19, it says, but we have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. This is God, this is Jesus when he broke the bread, okay? Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. Look what he did here, looked up. He looked up towards heaven and blessed them. What did he do? He looked up and he blessed them. He gave it to God and he blessed it, right? Then breaking the bread. What does it say there? Breaking. Does it say making? See, it doesn't say God made more bread. It doesn't say God went to the bakery real quick and cooked it up, right? It doesn't say that he went to go put it in the toaster for everybody, right? He didn't put some butter or some peanut butter. No, he didn't do that. It didn't say he went to go make more bread. It says that he broke what he had. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. And it said that they had 12 baskets full after. See, and don't get me wrong. I don't want you to sit here and think that it's because everyone got like the super tiniest piece. Right? It's like, no, that's, it's not, no, people didn't get crumbs. Because if there was left over, then no one got crumbs. They had the whole piece. Right? They had abundance. Right? It wasn't just, here you go, let me give you one slice. So you got to give it. No, no, no. God was like, here, I'm going to bless this. But he multiplied the blessing after it was broken. The multiplication happened after the breaking, not after the making. See, because when you're making more, you're just adding. But when you give it to God, God's breaking. See, sometimes we don't realize that. We think if we make more, we have more. Well, I'm telling you right now, when you give it to God, he's going to break it. See, what does that mean? See, not only, this wasn't the only time Jesus broke bread. Okay? God blessed it, then broke it. The multiplication ha- happened after the breaking. Jesus didn't say make more. He said, bring me what you have. Bring me what you have. He's not asking you, don't give tithes and offerings solely when you feel like you have enough. No, he said, with whatever you do have, bring it. Though it may not look like enough, it may not feel like enough, it may like seem like enough, whatever you do have, I need it. God's not going to ask you of anything you don't already possess in your own life. The problem, again, is not whether you do or do not possess it, is when God asks for it, will you give it to him or will it still be possessed over you? God wants to break it. He gave in thankfulness and then broke it. Are you going to be a bread maker or a bread breaker? I was almost going to title this message bread breaker, but I feel like it's a tongue twister. And I don't want to like, look weird up here, right? Are you going to be a bread maker or a bread breaker, right? So that, like I said, this wasn't the only time Jesus broke bread. It was, uh, he was with his disciples. And he said, this will be my body. And he took a piece of bread. We do this every time in the Holy Communion, right? We get a piece, only a piece. We don't break it, actually, here. But this is what the Bible says, is that he broke it. And he showed people that this was going to be his body, broken. See, because it wasn't that he was giving them something. He was giving them himself. Jesus wasn't breaking bread because to give them something. He was showing them that from who I am, I give to you. It wasn't about what he had. It was about who he was. And when you have Jesus in your life, you will learn how to break bread in every area of your life. Why? Because it's not about giving from what you have. You're giving from who he is. And when who he is is in your life, trust me. With this, I want to finish. Are you going to be cash-like or are you going to be Christ-like? Are you going to be cash-like or are you going to be Christ-like? See, God doesn't charge you interest on what he gave you. In the, in the beginning, it says that God created the world, right? We love talking about Genesis. And so he saw something was empty and he gave. What did he do? He gave. When Jesus gave his son, what did he do? He gave. Because if you love, you give. See, but some of you think that if you love, you have to take. And the only reason you feel like you have to take is because you're not secure and you're enough that if you don't have, you're not fulfilled. Can I tell you something? There's something and there's someone in your life that you can have that no matter whether you lose or you win, you'll always feel full. And that's called Jesus. No matter how much money, no matter how much things you possess, no matter your net worth, no matter what car you drive, no matter what clothes you have on or how much it costs, 
there is something that will always be more important and more valuable than that, and that is your salvation, and that is Jesus. And you think that has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with money. Because if it's involved in your life, then it involves God. Don't think that because you don't think it matters, that it doesn't involve God. If it affects you, God cares about it. If it hurts you, God wants to heal it. If it's been a reason why you don't have a relationship or you can't be with your kids, God wants to heal that. Just like God broke bread, he also, you also need to break chains. Generational curses have been upon your life and you haven't known it. I grew up in church and they taught me how to be generationally poor. They didn't teach me how to give to God. They taught me how to give with a little bit. They taught me, they passed around this little thing like we pass buckets here and they just put, just put a dollar and God will bless you. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying God is checking how much you give. But my heart was not in my giving. My heart was just in pleasing whatever the pastor said. I didn't have my own relationship with God. I didn't know what it was to tithe or to give offering. I thought, well, if I just give a dollar, and sometimes I'll give five, right? Isn't that crazy? I'll sometimes be like, all right, I'm, be, I'm feeling a little spicy today, so I'm going to give $10, right? Because $10 was the biggest bill I had in my wallet. And I was like, God, you're going to bless. I gave my biggest one. I didn't give a dollar. I gave 10 And you feel so happy. You're like, oh, I give 20 God, you're going to bless me now? See, it doesn't, see that's not what it, this is. God doesn't care about your treasure. He cares about your heart. So when you give your tithes and your offering, it's not because God is going to look at the amount. He's going to look at your heart and be like, even though you might feel like you're struggling, you still obeyed me. If you want God's outcome, check your obedience. If you want to seek God's outcome in your life, it's on the other side of your obedience. If God asks you to go here, are you going to go? It reminds me so much of, of Jonah, right? The reason he ended up in the whale, do you want to know why? It's because he didn't go to where God called him. Some of you have been put in places in your life that you never wanted to be in simply because you didn't listen to God. And that's the same thing with your finances. You've been in places in your life with your finances where you're like, God, why am I here? But it's because you never listened to his word. So when God asks you to give, what are you going to do? Give. When God says, God, when you, God tells you, hey, I want you to be at this church, I want you to plant yourself, and you need to give tithes and offerings, can you still do that even though you feel like you don't have enough? Just like last week we learned about cash or calling. Are we going to give because our calling God has placed it in us, or are we too busy chasing cash? Are we going to give because we want more paper, or are we going to give because God has given us a purpose? See, this morning, I want you to learn something today. God is more concerned about who you are as a person, less concerned about what you have in your life. God will take care of all of it, don't get me wrong. But he first needs to know that are you mine, right? Am I yours? Am I first in your life, right? And it's not even just about being first. We, we say God first all the time. So when you give your tithes and offerings, it's God first, right? But the thing is, God doesn't just want to be first in your life where you put a check mark after that. Or I, or I did my godly thing, so let me stop. No, it's actually like the sun. That's how God wants to be. What is the sun? What happens around the sun? We all revolve around the sun. Every single planet, it revolves around the sun. See, God wants to be like that, that every single area of your life revolves around him. That it's not just that he's first and check mark, I'm done with God. No, it's that in everything that I do, God is there. And everywhere that I go, God is there. In every aspect that I've, every journey, every adventure, God is there. Church, if you're ready to give up to God what is rightfully his, not just in tithes and offerings, but in every area of your life, I want you to stand to your feet and let's worship. Thank you, church.